David for leading us in worship. Thanks for Steve running the uh, PowerPoint back there, for Bobby doing sound. Welcome to the mind. Good to be here. Um, if this is your first time, we have a couple of mic runners, and this is an opportunity for us to dialogue rather than me just tell you what I think about the Word of God. And so if you have a question or thought or comment, please just raise your hand, and we have some great volunteers that will get a mic into your hands so, you can, so everyone can hear the question or comment. Um, if someone has a phone or they can jump on a phone here and do some multiplication or maybe you're, you, you do this in your head, uh, can you tell me the average number of days that someone would live? I guess it wouldn't be average if they were 75. Can someone figure that number out and just shout it out? Uh, secondly, hey Bobby, can we get mood lighting in here? Can those, those bulbs turn on? Those uh, cool, uh, trendy looking cafe things? I think that'd just be awesome if we did the mine with making it look like we're outdoors. Um, and then thirdly, turn to Acts 21, because that's where we're at tonight, okay? Um, we're going to do Acts 21 tonight and see if we can get through the whole thing. And uh, then next week, we're going to try to wrap up Acts 22 to 28. The problem is, is there's just so much good stuff in the book of Acts that I just feel like if we, if we just gloss over this particular chapter, we're going to miss a whole bunch. And so we'll just trust God that whatever we get through is what we get through. Uh, 75 years old, how many days is that? 27, 375, great, okay. I ask that because most of us in the room, can we just be honest, we're on the back half, right? We're somewhere, the number that's dialing down on top of our heads, you know, some of us are at 20, 25,000, um, some are 27,000 right now, um, and some of us are at 15, 16,000. Not to be uh, melodramatic here, but grade yourself on the days you've used so far. God's given you the average 27 plus thousand days on earth and it is appointed for man to live once and then die and then face judgment. And for those of us, I'm, I'm you know, on the back half of that number, maybe some of us are in here. How, do, how are we doing? Are we, are, we, are we actually taking into account that that number, whatever it started from the day we were born is dialing down to zero? And guys, when it hits zero, there's, there's, there's no amount of prayers in the world that's going to add to that. God has appointed a number for you, and that number is set. And, and the, the great thing about the life we live is we don't know what that number is. And so we live by faith. And we trust God that I'm going to get up tomorrow, and I'm going to glorify you with my words and my thoughts and my deeds. And so we pray prayers like when we go to bed, you know, if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Because we just don't know. And yet, don't we often fall into this routine of, I'm guaranteed? Uh, God, I have to. You have to give me another few years because i got big plans. Uh, we just had a kid, God, and, and that, you know, that affords me another 40. Uh, I just got a raise and there's no way you're taking me. <laughs> I worked hard for that raise. Just got a job transfer, which I just, I fell in love, God, I just got married. You owe me. And what God says throughout the word of God, guys, is I'm in control. I know what's best, but you're a part of a bigger plan. This life is not about you. This life is about me. And you're a part of my big plan. And so be faithful to the days I've given you, knowing that you don't know how many I've given you. I say that because in Acts 21, the Apostle Paul, I think, figured that out. Do you realize that as we've gone through the book of Acts, that the majority of Paul's life was lived as a non-Christian? you realize that the greatest Christian of all time spent the majority of his life living apart from God? As the Word of God said, as, as an enemy of God? So God flips his life in Acts chapter 9, road to Damascus, and what Paul does over the next season is he spends his life with purpose. He spends his life, and, and dare I say, almost every day of the time when God saved him till the time he dies, guys, he spends it with a conviction, with, with an ultimate goal in mind. And we're arriving kind of towards the back half, and certainly the back half, but almost even the back, back half of Paul's life now. And you can almost sense this urgency even more present. He becomes a believer in Acts chapter 9, and you can see right away he's just jacked up, ready to share God with whomever will listen. 
But now that he's arrived at, I've planted churches, I'm on my third journey around this part of the world to minister to these people. Some of us would say, um, check your 401. Make sure you've got things locked up because you're, you're heading to that age, right? You're headed to that golden age, Paul, and you need to figure out how you're going to secure those golden years financially. And Paul, we just don't see that. Rather, we see, I, I think I'm headed to a place that's probably eventually going to kill me, and I'm going to go anyway. And guys, I think that when we have that attitude and that mentality, it allows us to champion phrases like Paul Champion, which is, I've run the race well, I've fought the fought the fight hard and, and ahead of me lies the finish line but if I'm still breathing I haven't crossed it yet guys a gold watch and a, and a, and a party and a Baskin Robbins cake at your office doesn't mean you've finished um, uh, you know we've done a great job here in America of solidifying the fact that 65 is it for you and how many of us are close to that age or at that age or over that age where we're almost offended by that? Uh, my life has yet to begin kind of thinking. I want to encourage us tonight, I guess. If you came in tonight sluggish, if you came in tonight uh, purposeless, if you came in tonight just feeling like I I I'm done, can I just encourage you? The fact that you're here gives me hope. That I don't know if you really truly believe that. The fact that you're here tells me, God, I think I'm done. I feel like I've done enough or I just don't have enough in the tank. Or, but I'm here because I'm not going to make that decision, God. I'm going to let you make that decision. And I think as long as we have that attitude, guys, God's going to do some amazing things with you. And then one day he will say, it's time for you to come home. Okay, turn to Acts chapter 21. A couple quick uh, Thoughts, and then I want to get into uh, asking you a question here. Uh, turn back to Acts 20, actually. Let's start in uh, 36. Paul's on his third missionary journey. Uh, Steve, I don't know if you can throw this. I've got a little map up here. Does that come up? Uh, just so that we're kind of in the, in the ballpark here. I need this help as much as anyone to figure out, okay, where, where are we when they start announcing cities in the Bible? Uh, so that's Italy over there, okay? So just work your way over. Then I'll blow it up a little bit. Uh, Paul, again, is on missionary journey number three. And we'll work our way down uh, to Patera and then down to Tyre into Caesarea. Caesarea. And then Paul's gonna eventually going to make it to Jerusalem. That's his goal in 21 is to get to Jerusalem. Okay, So that's kind of where we're at. So I'll just keep that up and you can um, challenge yourself geographically to see what else you know up there. In 20, 36, he says, and when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. He was in Ephesus for a uh, little over three years. Um, and he says that in verse 31 of chapter 20. Knelt down and prayed with them. They began to weep aloud and they embraced Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken that, he, that they should see his face no more and they were accompanying, accompanying him to the ship. Again, just keeping in mind this idea of what we're talking about, uh, you know, grading myself, how, how, how have I done so far? Guys, he spent three years in a city and they're weeping aloud and embracing him, repeatedly kissing him, grieving, especially over the word that he's not gonna see him anymore. Do, do, do you leave, you know, you show up at my house for my birthday party, you leave, am I doing this with you? I mean, you're with me for three years. Am I doing this because of the impact you had on my life? I find that fascinating that after three years, 36 short months, he's leaving and he says, listen, this is, this is going to be it. You know, I feel like this is probably going to be the last time we're going to see each other. People just broke down. Three short years. Uh, guys, some of us, again, are 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, even to our 70s. Three years is nothing to us, right? It's like blink and three years goes by. And sometimes I think that that's our mentality, which is I'm just wanting to get to the next thing. Whatever the next thing is, I, I'm, I'm restless here, so I just got to go to the what's my next thing. And while Paul did demonstrate an air of restlessness by planting church after church and whatnot, he planted himself in Ephesus for at least three years. 
And what I love about that passage is it doesn't seem like he wasted time too much. And keep in mind, guys, because I think our argument back to Paul is, well, I would have that kind of impact too if I was Pastor Lynn, right? I would have that kind of impact too if, if I was up here every week, you know, preaching. And Paul is bivocational. Paul's out making tents. Paul's out hammering nails and driving pegs in and sewing and he didn't want to be a burden to people, so he's trying to pay his own way, basically. This guy was busy. And yet, when he left their midst, they wept. I wonder. Uh, you know, sad to say, but, you know, God's kind of moving my family and I to, to Portland. What's the reaction? I heard one person say this, speaking of... Uh, the day and age we live in, um, something to the effect of I shut down my Facebook page and, oh, okay, well, I get, that's good. Um, wh why, you know, why so sad? Uh, because I only heard from like, what, 10 or 12 people that, you know, they were kind of bummed that I, that I shut it down or something to the effect of like, no one really cared that I shut my Facebook page down. You know, woe's me, like I'm just, you know, I'm upset over that. Paul says, listen, I got to go to Jerusalem. I don't think I'm going to see you guys anymore. People are breaking down. Please don't, don't, don't let that not be true. Those times hurt, right? When people impact us that much and they say, I got to go. God's moving me. Those times hurt, but aren't they also chock full of, of wealth? Aren't they also just so rich, you're so glad to be in that group in that moment to say to that person, I cannot begin to tell you how much you've impacted me. But most of us, it takes a lifetime to do that. Funerals are a great example of, you know, the depth of someone's life in terms of the impact, the legacy. But again, that's typically, not all the time, but typically 60, 70, or 80 years, we've known them. Paul spent three years with these people. And they say, I can't believe you're telling us this. Do, do you have that impact? Could, could we? Could you have that impact? What's it going to take to have that impact? I think number one, it takes purpose. Do you know why you're here right now? Um, Paul seemed to know that. But he also seemed to know it's bigger than this. Because I got to go. And so no matter how deep we are in relationship right now, I got to take off. And so he does. Look at verse 20, chapter 21. And when it came about that when we had parted from them, Luke's writing this, of course, and had set sail, we ran a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera, and having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. And when we had come in the sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload its cargo. Verse 4. And after looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days. And the disciples, now watch this, the disciples kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. All right, so here's my question for you. Go back to uh, chapter 19 and look at verse 21. Go back to chapter 19 and 21. Cha uh, chapter 19, verse 21. Now, after these things were finished, Paul purposed in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem after he passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, after I've been there, I must also, I must see Rome also. Okay, think about that. As you're thinking about that, go to chapter 20 and look at starting in 22. Okay, be thinking about this because I'm going to ask a question here in just a moment. And now, chapter 20, 20, verse 22, and now behold, bound in spirit, I am on my, Paul saying this, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit so I got excited there. Except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. 
But I do not consider my life on any account as dear to myself in order that I may finish my course and that the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And then again, now look over to chapter 21, verse 4. And after looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days and they kept telling Paul through the what? Through the Spirit to do what? Not to go where? Oh boy, we got a problem. I don't know much, but I know this. We got a problem right now. What's the problem? Paul's saying in chapter 19 and 20, who's telling him to go to Jerusalem? The Spirit. He meets some disciples in chapter 21, verse 4, and they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. So my question to us tonight is this. Who's right? Are you team Paul or team disciples? You Hunger Games fans. Uh, So I got a couple of mic runners here. Okay, I've given you about 10 seconds to think about this. And guys, here's why I'm asking this. True confessions, okay? Lest you think, um, well, he's just, he's going to tell me anyway, so I don't care. I don't know. I don't have an answer. I read this and I'm like, wait, did, did I miss? Ha- wait a minute. Like, I think like Luke put a knot in there. It should read, and they kept telling Paul through the Spirit to set foot in Jerusalem. Then we'd have consistency. But guys, this is why we show up, I think. think. Because now we have, seemingly, inconsistency. So let's dialogue about this. Let's try to work through this. Disciples say, don't go. Paul says, I'm going. And they're both claiming, what's both of their trump cards? Spirit. Like they're, uh, Paul, you can't go. Actually, I can. No, you can't. Actually, I can. Well, the Spirit said you can't. Well, the Spirit said I can. And now we're at a dead, we're at a dead halt. Well, God the Father said, you know, where do you, where do you go from there? So, raise your hand. Give us some thoughts, oh wise counsel. Talk to us tonight. How do you, how do you make sense of this? Because we need to make sense of this. I need to make sense of this. So help me out here. I've got a few thoughts, but love to hear yours. I think it's the perception of the disciples first. You know what I'm going to say, right? Right. It's just one, one or the other. Yeah, it's why'd like you pick them? Their, their perception of the Holy Spirit. Because they're not Paul. <laughs> so it just depends on that, the, what, what everybody's uh, you know, opinion is. Yeah, but well, let me ask you this. I appreciate you saying it. No, no, hold the mic. You're, we're, not, we're not done yet. Um, <laughs> why, why do you say perception, though? Because everybody has a different opinion or a different walk with God or the Holy Spirit. So if Paul says, well, I have this walk and I, you know, um, have this with the Holy Spirit, and the disciples are like, no, we have this with them, it's always going to be like a clash of opinions. Okay. Yes, but then how do you answer, how would you answer someone that said, well, why can't it be Paul's opinion? I mean, I think that's where they're stuck. And then we're just pretty much like, okay, well, we're just going to let them go to Uh, Jerusalem. I'm sorry, a little louder, I couldn't hear you. Oh, I said the disciples were just letting him go to Jerusalem at that point because, like, even though we're saying that the Holy Spirit says not to, you're saying the Holy Spirit is telling me to. So they're like, okay, well, maybe he knows something that we don't. Okay, yep. That's a solid answer because, but let me just play devil's advocate here. But that's ins- isn't that insufficient in the sense of, hey, Paul, the Spirit is telling, because guys, we talked about this like four weeks ago, right? We talked about the fact that these sign gifts and when the Spirit, and, and we've talked about this actually throughout the whole year. When the Spirit tells you to do something, what should you do? You should do it. Move to Portland. Yeah, I don't know. You better go. So what, what I struggle with is 
Paul shows up. They stay with him for a week. He's like, yeah, I'm headed. Because he's not there yet, right? He's not at Jerusalem yet. He's in Caesarea. He's like, I'm going to Jerusalem. And then they gather, and what do they say to him? Listen, Paul. We've been told through the Spirit, don't go. And so my, my struggle is, it's one thing if the disciples say, not good, right, not good, I wouldn't go. Wise counsel says not good. But if the Spirit's leading you, who are, who are we to stop you, right? That, that would make sense. That's Christianese right there. Hey, I think I'm going to marry her. Okay. Well, I know her. And you probably shouldn't. Well, the Spirit told me I should. Hey, who am I to stop you, right? I mean, I don't want to get in the Spirit's way. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's our lingo around here. The problem with this passage is they've got the same kind of lingo, right? Uh, you shouldn't go. I should. Well, the Spirit said you shouldn't. Well, the Spirit said I should. Same Spirit. Right, but that's, how many that's... times have anybody from then to now have the same conversation you know, like elders that have been involved in the church and stuff for a really long time versus a baby Christian, and they're saying, maybe you shouldn't do that, but then I would say, you know, the Holy Spirit is telling me this, so I'm going to do it anyway. It's like our own perception of what the Holy Spirit says. Yeah, no, I, it's tough because, listen, when I tell people, like, how to make decisions, um, pray about it, um, wise counsel, and spirit-led. And so Paul seemingly has spirit-led. And so are you saying, I guess, the, the, this isn't wise counsel per se, because he's only been there for a week and probably most likely more mature than they are. So I, I'll probably, I could go with that. I just struggle with why, is, why did they say through the Spirit? Um, why not just go with, I just don't think it's a good idea, Paul, but if you are being led by the Spirit, then go for it. All right, here we go. Teach us. Somebody's got a mic, yeah. I just had an impression the Spirit's showing what's in store for Paul. And that's consistent with what was told them before, which is not fun and games. It's going to be very painful and difficult and a trial. So perhaps in 21.4, they're seeing that in the spirit, the same thing that they saw before. And the reaction is, you shouldn't go because all this bad stuff's going to happen to you as compared to, for instance, Christ going to the cross. That wasn't fun and games, but that's what obedience was. Why do you have to be so smart? <laughs> That's awesome. That's fantastic. And, and I think we're, we're both getting to the same place. Could it be? Could it be? Um, listen to the wording again. And they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. Are they saying the Spirit told us you can't go to Jerusalem? Is that what they're saying here? It doesn't seem like it, but maybe they're saying, listen, what the Spirit's told us, Paul, is this. You set foot in Jerusalem, it's not going to go well for you. And maybe, could it be maybe that Paul's saying, yeah, I, he already told me that two chapters ago. I got to go. Possibly. Okay? I, I bring this to our attention, guys, because I don't want this to be a place where we ignore seeming contradictions. I just don't think this is one of them. I think that answer is, is very salient. I think that's a great answer to this potential problem here. Okay? I'm not sure we'll ever have full authority to rest on exactly what it means until we get to heaven, but I like that. I like the fact that these guys could go to Paul, even as young believers, and say, the Spirit talks to us too. The Spirit moves in our lives too. And what we've seen for your life, if you go to Jerusalem, is very, very bad. So we'd, we'd, we'd appreciate you not going. You're doing such good things here. Watch this. Oh, any other thoughts, by the way? I don't want to cut anyone short. It's hard for me to say. Okay. Um, 
it doesn't stop there. Watch this. And when it came about that our, oh, so let me just say this, first of all. Go to uh, 1 Corinthians 14. Let me just wrap up the, the, this issue and then we'll move on. 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 and uh, look at 1 Corinthians 14. Let's go to 29 while we're on the topic. I think, guys, this is why Paul says what he does in 29. Uh, yeah, 27 through. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at the most three, and each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church, let him speak to himself and to God, and let two or three prophets speak, and let the others pass judgment. Okay, so hang on to that thought, and then go to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and uh, let's look at, um, start with 16, look at 5 starting in 16. 5, 16 says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, which by the way in the Greek, that phrase there is like a hacking cough. Uh, I love that. It's like a, you pray so much that the people around you are almost kind of annoyed by it because it's just constant praying. I love that. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. See, I think with Paul's wisdom here, guys, because I don't want to deny the Spirit moving in your life. I don't. But Paul uses wisdom here to say, when people say things like, God told me, especially when they say things like this, God told me to tell you. He says, check it, fact check it, as best as you possibly can. Guys, if it really is from God, then what do you have to worry about? Uh, if I stand up here and say, God told me, and then announce a prophecy or announce some sort of prophetic utterance, you are obligated to check that, to make sure that what I'm saying is actually from God. So whenever we see in the scriptures prophecy being mentioned and we've already looked in the book of Acts at false prophets um, and we see them even alive and well today it's it's not well I got most of it right it's not well the spirit told me and I'm kind of in the same ballpark God doesn't work like that God is a God of exactness and that's why we champion all of these great Old Testament prophecies about Jesus because they were exact and they were perfect so why shouldn't we do the same today? I love, I love telling people to check this book. Because the more they do, the more it, it validates itself. Geographically, archaeologically, accuracy-wise, it just does. Dead Sea Scrolls were a perfect example of that. Okay, so I like that answer. Let's go with it and keep moving here because I want to get to something else. And when it came about that our days were ended, we departed and started on our journey, chapter 21, verse 5, while they all, with wives and children, escorted us until we were out of the city. And after kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. It's a great way to send people off. I love that. And then we went aboard on the ship, and they returned home again. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Platameus. And after greeting the brethren, we stayed there for a day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea. And entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man, Philip, had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. And, and by the way, um, if you want to do a cross-reference there, uh, Joel 2, 28, 29, great, great uh, passage. Um, speaking of the daughters who were prophetesses. Uh, Joel says in it shall, uh, Joel chapter 2, 28 and 29, And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. I love, I love how God is affirming that, I guess, here in Acts 21. 
And as they were staying there for some days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Now watch this again. And coming to us, he took, Paul, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands. So the guy comes up to Paul, says, hey, can I borrow your belt for a second? Yeah, I guess, you know. It's, you know. Guy takes his belt and binds his hands and feet his own hands and feet, and says to Paul, this is what the Holy Spirit says. Now he's providing a visual. The disciples didn't provide a visual. They just said, we think through the Spirit, you shouldn't go. This guy now shows up from Judea, makes the trek. Hey, can I borrow your belt? Doesn't even come with his own props, has to borrow Paul's. Wraps himself up, hog ties himself, and says, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. It couldn't be any clearer to Paul what's going to happen to him in Jerusalem, could it? Paul, don't go. You, you've got options here. Do you live with purpose, right? Do, do, do you live with conviction so much so that when this way seems countercultural, when this way seems like a bad decision, humanly speaking, um, you, you go for it. We're going to downsize, honey. That's a bad decision. I, I think God's telling me to downsize. I, don't, I just don't need. Uh, we're, I we're packing up and we're moving. We're going to do the full-time mission thing, honey. It's not a great decision. Where are we going to, what about the kids' education? I don't know. I just feel like God's telling us to do that. Um, I'm starting a new business. And, and let me just flip it because those are all kind of, you know, oh, I've got to, you know, do these great things for the Lord and, like, become these things. Um, I think we should make more money than we're making right now, honey. Okay. Uh, because I feel like God wants us to, to, to get all the money we can so that we can give 80% of it away and for his glory. Oh. <laughs> okay. God, I, I, feel like, I feel like the Spirit's telling us this year, honey, 2015, we need to double our tithe. See, guys, that's countercultural. And, and you may even have some great godly people say to you, I'm not seeing it. That's a little too close to the margin of good decision versus that was really, really not good. Um, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you deal with Paul here when so many people are coming to him, godly people are coming to him saying, don't go to Jerusalem? How do you still go? And guys, sometimes I think we read passages like this and we think, well, that's Paul. He had to go. He didn't have to go any more than you have to quit your job and move or any more than you have to change locations or any more than you have to, you know, minister to these people or any more than you and I have to make decisions. In fact, I'll argue this, guys. He had enough evidence from people through the Spirit to not go. More so than, than I often do in my decisions. I don't, I don't often have people coming asking me to borrow my belt. Not lately. Greg, God's telling me for you not to do or to do. I don't, I don't usually have that. Paul had direct confrontation seemingly from godly people. And when he heard this, verse 12... We as well as the local residents began begging him again not to go up to Jerusalem. Luke's included in this. Then listen to Paul's answer. And, and get, guys, get the feeling here, okay? Listen to Paul's answer, but get the feeling here. What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. It, it, guys, do you get the feeling here that Paul is invested in these people? That this is not an easy decision for Paul to make. That, that they're saying things that he, his, his humanness says, you're killing me here. 
You're breaking my heart right now. But watch the back half. For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. We could go round and round and you could tell me every reason why not to go and I'm going to go. And even if I have to die in Jerusalem, I'm going. Um, Paul lived with purpose in a way that his life became secondary. Um, I, Jesus Freaks, it's kind of a cool book. Revolutionaries, stories of revolutionaries who changed their, changed their world, fearing God, not man. Uh, A.D. 111, Ignatius, Emperor Trajan, having finally settled political matters of the empire by, by defeating the Scythians, Dacians, and other nations that had threatened the borders of Rome, made the decision to conquer in the area of religion as well, thus decreeing the third major period of Roman persecution. According to his edict, all those subject to Roman law were required to sacrifice to Roman gods. This policy had been quite successful, except for the this new sect called Christians. Deciding to make an example for the others, when he arrived at Antioch in his travels, he tried Ignatius before himself before an assembly of Ignatius' peers and disciples in that city. Ignatius was the leader of the church of Antioch, one of the foremost Christians alive after John's passing. Guys, this is AD 111, okay? What we're looking at is about AD 57, AD 58. Fast forward 60 years, three generations. Yet to Trajan's surprise, the condemnation to a painful death did not phase Ignatius. Instead, Ignatius looked to heaven and said, Oh, thank you, Lord, that you have guaranteed to honor me with a perfect love toward you and have made me to be bound with chains as the apostle Paul was. In the following months, Ignatius was escorted to Rome by ten soldiers whom he called leopards for their harsh, the harsh way they treated him. Yet, through this, he took what time he could to encourage the Christians. Upon arrival in Rome, Ignatius was brought before the governor and there imprisoned. Over the next few weeks, he was subjected to several tortures and trials to try to induce him to blaspheme the name of Jesus and sacrifice to the Roman gods. Yet Ignatius' faith did not weaken but grew bolder. In the end, he was brought before the Roman Senate who condemned him to be immediately cast to the lions. As he stood in the center of the arena, ready to meet his sentence... He looked up at the audience and proclaimed this. O oh, you Romans, all of you who have come to witness with your own eyes this combat, I want you to know that this punishment is not because of any misdeed or crime, but that I may come to God for whom I long and for whom to enjoy this is my insatiable desire. For I am the grain of God. I am ground by teeth of the beasts that I may be found a purebred for Christ who is to me the bread of life. And as soon as he spoke these words, two lions were released from their pits and charged the bishop of Antioch and so tore and devoured him in a matter of minutes that very little of him was left, even of his bones. 60 years later. And guys, this entire, this entire book from AD 60 to present are stories after stories after stories of people who get it. People who have lived with purpose. Now, you say to me, um, that's not me, and that will never be me, in the sense of, no one's going to throw me to the lions. And you're right. So, guys, let's just ask the question tonight. What is our persecution here? W what is our, our uh, Emperor Trajan in 21st century America, Chandler, Arizona. It's not this. Long will be the day before you and I pass where I think we'll face persecution here in Chandler to the degree where our lives are at stake. So now we get a pass, right? Now we, this doesn't apply. No, 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 no. What is your persecution? What's my persecution? Can I help us with that tonight? Because I've been thinking about this a lot. And I just think it's so subtle and I don't know that we're even acknowledging it. 
but I think it's culture. I think it's society is our emperor Trajan. Well, what do you mean, Greg? I have the freedom to worship, and now we have the freedom to come. Yeah, 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 I get that. But what is it that we're actually doing? See, guys, Satan, I think, in this season of, of our history, Satan has flipped it from first century in-your-face persecution to 21st century apathetic persecution, meaning I'll just woo them to sleep. And while they're sleeping at church, I will introduce now ungodliness amongst the culture, so much so, and so creatively so, that it will become pervasive. And before you know it, when they wake up from their slumber, they will be steeped in it themselves. And you say to me, um, okay, well, now it's time to leave because he's gone crazy. All right. Uh, can I just share a few things with you? Do we have that up, Steve? Okay, good. Um, guys, this is what's happening today. Just real, real quickly here. Uh, 2005, Christian Smith, Melinda um, Lundquist Denton coined this phrase, and, and, but I need you to realize that this is what, you know, so there's baby boomers, there's Gen Xers, um, and then there's what they call millennials or Gen Yers or even Gen Mears. They're all the same people group. People born from 82 to present would basically fit in the category of Gen Mears, Gen Yers, millennials. Okay, so if you're in that category, uh, you're a, you're a millennial. If you're, if you're uh, what, 65 to 81, I believe, you're an Xer. And then if you're beyond that, you're a boomer. And if you're beyond that, you're a radio ager. Um, this is what they're saying the millennials are being taught today, by, both in church and in culture. A God who exists, who created order, and the world watches over human life on earth. Okay, that's deism. God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. Is, do, are we taught in the Bible to be good, nice, and fair to each other? Yes, but guess what, guys? Every religion teaches that. And so what you have is inclusivism. Hey, we need to be fair. Why? Because I'm a Christian. Oh, good, I'm a Hindu. We need, of course we need to be. I'm a Muslim. We need to be, of course we're fair to each other. See, now we're all the same. It's ecumenicalism. Um... The central goal of life is to be happy and feel good about oneself. Is that really the central goal of life? But guys, I cannot tell you how prevalent that is amongst youth today. What is your goal in life? To be happy and feel good about myself. Number four, God did not, ex God did not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when there's problems. I spun this world into motion. I created you to be happy. When you need me, call on me is the message our youth are hearing today. And finally, I don't know if you can see this, number five, good people go to heaven when they die. That's what's being taught today, guys. And, and I don't say that because these authors have said it. I said that because the research they've done and the thousands upon thousands of kids they've interviewed are saying this. That's why they're doing, they're saying what they're saying, okay? Now take that thought. Take the thought of, be happy, be good, God's there if you need him, and if you're good enough, you go to heaven when you die, and then move it to this other area, which is a diverse sexuality in our culture today. And here's what you end up with. In 2005, the average number of hours a teenager would spend with media content, iPhones, iPads, televisions, etc., was eight hours and 30 minutes a day. That was in 2005. Five years later, it went up to 10 hours, 45 minutes a day. 10 hours, 45 minutes a day on average. And you say, well, that's not my kid. Then write a book and sell it and tell us how, how your kid's not doing this. Okay? Because teenagers, guys, and millennials, that, that includes people in their 20s now and late 20s even, are averaging this. Uh, I mean, this is on media right now. I ask my students, I teach over Valley Christian, I ask my students, how many of you do not own a cell phone? Now again, guys, we're talking about ninth grade up to 12th grade. In our school, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade, three kids did not own a cell phone. Three. 
Ninth graders are 14 years old, guys. Three of them did not own a cell phone from 14 to 18 years old. Why is that important? So what? They're on media. Media is powerful, right? That's the message we hear. Media is, is everything. True. Except for this. In 2005, 11% of the media early, early adolescents use contained sexual content. 40% of the early adolescents' music contained sexual content. Less than one half of 1% of the content in the media young teens use contains positive sexual health content. And then this bottom one. Among abstinent teens, increased exposure to sexual media content, including sexually explicit media, and increased perception of media support for teen sexual behavior leads to increased cognitive susceptibility to initiating sexual intercourse and ultimately early sexual intercourse. In other words, a bunch of mumbo jumbo that simply says this, when I'm doing this for eight to 10 hours a day, Satan says, here's some sex along with it, almost all of it's ungodly, and before you know it, I'm engaging in those activities. That's what all of these surveys are telling us. Furthermore, 93% of boys and 63% of girls in 2008 who took this particular study were exposed to online pornography during adolescence. 93%. Nine out of 10 teenage boys I line up here in 2008 said, yeah, I've looked at porn. This led to this conclusion. If participants in this study are typical of young people, exposure to pornography on the internet can now be described as a normative experience. Normative. That was six years ago, guys. Do you think the porn industry has slowed down? Hey, listen. Let's gather, you know, here's the deal is I think we're adversely affecting teens today. So let's just back up a little bit. Let's, you know, we're not going to create as much porn because of this 2008. What are you kidding me? This is a new market share for us. Let's drive it down their throats. Nine out of ten boys and six out of ten girls are saying, yeah, to the point where this researcher said, it, it might as well describe it as a normative experience. School is a normative experience. Reading is a normative experience. Pornography, 21st century millennial normative experience. I don't know if you can see the bottom of this. 2013 Gallup poll, 2013, 49% of millennials believe porn to be morally acceptable. Half. Pornography is morally acceptable. That was three years ago, two years ago. Furthermore, the majority of, this is Barna speaking, George Barna, the guru of research. He says this, the majority of America's kids are not clamoring for X-rated profane and violent content on TV. Okay, so he's bringing balance to this. Listen, your kid's not a, a freak. They're not a sexual pervert, but they are constantly seduced and tantalized by messages and imagery that blur or overstep the boundaries of decency. Maybe our young ones are not the sexually depraved beings that some have charged, but we must recognize that their perceptions of sexual propriety have been sufficiently compromised and that most kids will wind up with a sexually transmitted disease and an unfulfillable longing to return to virgin status. That's from Barna. Furthermore, Jen Twenge is like the expert with the millennials. She says this in her book, Generation Me. Gen Me simply takes it for granted that we should all feel good about ourselves. We are all special and we all deserve to follow our dreams. Gen Me is straightforward and unapologetic about their self-focus. In 2008, 28,000 college students were surveyed and, and the most frequent on self-esteem. How do you feel about yourself? And the most frequent self-esteem score was 40 that they recorded. The highest number you could put was 40. And that was the most frequent answer. That was in 2008 out of 28,000 college students. In 2012, they did a survey with high school students. And they said, answer this question. Do you think you're above average in intelligence? 
65% that took the survey said yes, compared to 56% of us that were in high school in 76, we said, yeah, I'm above average. That went up now 11 percentage points. Why does that matter? The number who described themselves as far above average from 76 to 2012 nearly doubled. Do you think you're intelligent? Above average. And then the double was, I'm, real, I'm far above average. Yet, when the standardized testing came out in 2012, the results were the same as 76. You're not that smart. You just think you are. Why? Guys, because of this. I'm not going to feel good about myself if I'm not smart. So how do I know I'm smart? I tell myself I am. It's the age-old Saturday Night Live skit. Whatever, in the mirror, right? You're good enough, and doggone it, I like you. And that's what we're telling ourselves, guys. By the way, you're, they're not the only ones to blame, educators out there, myself included. Great inflation is incredible. Another survey was done, I don't have it up here. In 2012, the number of kids getting A's today Again, based on their standardized test scores, is ridiculous. It's, it's almost, it is, in fact, more than double the amount from 76. Like 19% of kids in 76 were going to college as straight A type students. 39% are going to college today as straight A students. Standardized testing, no difference in the scores. Why, how is that? In fact, Kids today are studying an average of 10 hours a week. In 1976, 21 hours a week. We're sending kids off telling them this message that you're better than life itself. And guys, they're the next leaders of our churches. What's the point? Uh, you know, maybe there is no point except this. I love this from Twins. She says this. Watch this, because this is fascinating. I wonder, she says, what will happen when this generation have their own children? Will they continue the move toward lesser parental authority or insist that they retain the authority they've grown accustomed to? If Gen Me teaches our own children or their own children to be individualistic as well, we may have a full-scale battle of the wills once our kids become teenagers themselves. Do you see what's happening here? If, you, if you're growing up under this, this, this delusion that you are God's gift to everything and you deserve all the freedom and independence and self-glorification you can get, you're going to have kids of your own one day. And those of us who have had kids, you know there is a great sigh of relief when you get to tell your kid what to do because you were told what to do by your parents and now it's your turn. And the Gen Me generation is saying, you don't get to tell me what to do, mom and dad. I'll do whatever I want makes me happy. But they're going to have kids of their own one day. And they're going to realize it doesn't work that way. And so what she's asking is, fast forward 20 years from now. What's the Gen Me kid going to do when they're 35 or 40 trying to raise a kid in the same way that they feel entitled themselves to? See, you're going to have this battle now. So guys, can I just bring it back, I guess, to full circle? And the full circle is this. Maybe, maybe this is where we need to land. For consider yourself or consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world, and the despised God, and, and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Maybe, maybe your persecution, Christian, moving forward, is culture. 
maybe it's time that we take a stand for what we know to be true, regardless of what it costs us. You are, I am in a position where you've got to walk this fine line for fearing of offending. And I'm just wondering, how far are we going to let this go? Honestly, how far? So maybe your persecution is going to come in the form of this. This is what the word of God says. And I say this as a humble servant of God. I'm not moving off point. I'm not. I'm convicted that this is the truth. Regardless of what you think or even culture thinks. Guys, I don't, I don't know much. I really don't. But I know this. Pornography is not morally acceptable. According to this. It will never be. I don't care what people say, how much we're inundated with it, how much you and I trip over it and stumble over it. It will never be acceptable. Can you see the argument, though? Everyone's doing it. It's the norm. It doesn't matter. See, I think our fight over the next three, four decades, till God calls us home, is going to be just that. I'm taking a stand because of my convictions, and my convictions are birthed out of this word. Yeah, it may not cost me my life, but I don't know, what, what could it cost you? Because guys, when Paul dies, he's going to, without a doubt, get well done, good and faithful servant. I didn't want you to do everything, Paul. I wanted you to do this. I think as we leave tonight, it needs to resonate with us What's my this? And guys, we're falling asleep spiritually. And again, I don't know much, but I know the evil one's never sleeping. He's a lion ready to devour. But I think his angle for us is I'm not going to just go rip you apart. I'll woo you to sleep. I'll send in the troops all around you, and I'll just seep it in. Technology, through your family dysfunctions, through your inabilities. Because, listen, my kid needs to feel happy. They need to feel like a winner. And so I need to promote that and pump that into them, even though they're struggling in major areas of life. But who am I to tell them only that I'm their parent? Um... Okay, I, I, boy, I was about to go off on a tangent there. Do, do you realize how much ed educators are hamstrung nowadays, guys? Honestly. And I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but I'll say it anyway. Um, if you're a parent and you take your kid's side before you hear the full story, shame on you. Your kid comes home and says, Miss Smith yelled at me today, and you take your kid's side before you hear Mrs. Smith's side, the, the fourth grade teacher. Wh where did that come from other than... This perception that my kid's always right. Guys, I got five of them at home. I can't think of a time where any of them are always right. <laughs> Even collectively, there's always one of them, if not most of them. So when one of them comes home and says, I failed this, or, you know, the last thing I want to do is say, oh, my gosh, come, let me come here. Why did you fail? I didn't study. Oh, um, I don't know, man. But I think that's, I, I know that's my persecution. My persecution in this day and age is you don't got to go win the world for Christ, Greg. You need to stand up for what you believe in. The world is winning the battle right now. I think we could do better, huh? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. As we, as we kind of wrap up Acts next week and, and we see Paul just laying it straightforward. As he goes to Jerusalem, he's bound in chains. The prophecies do come true. He will end up losing his life here very shortly. But God, I, I just know he went to his grave free. Free that he, he lived life well. Not perfect, but he lived life well. Because he stood up for what he believed in. He preached what he knew to be true. And he trusted you with the results. I pray, Father, for the mine people, the miners here tonight, that maybe we could do that. Maybe I could do that better than I'm currently doing that. And God, I know that that starts and kind of ends with 
um, investing into your word. So praise you, God, tonight for these people that showed up because they could be doing a lot of other things. Uh, and it's, it's an investment into your word that's gonna give us the courage and strength to stand up for what we know to be true to neighbors, coworkers, children. Um, and God, lead, lead humbly, uh, but lead with accuracy. So God, give us that strength. I know I need it, uh, and we'll give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you next week.